Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I want to welcome you to this one-hour webinar hosted by the Learning Policy Institute. We'd like to let the audience know that this webinar is open to the public and is being recorded. A video recording will be emailed to you in a few days and available at the link just shared in the chat. We'd all also like to announce that the next webinar in this series, How It's Done, What School Networks Can Teach Us About Scaling Up Deeper Learning Practices, will be announced in a few weeks. Please sign up for our mailing list to receive a notification or check our website's upcoming events page. You can also view previous webinars from this series from the link shared in the chat box. Today, I'll begin with an introduction of the Reimagining College Access Initiative, a national effort to bring high-quality K-12 performance assessments into college admissions, placement, and success. We'll then have a discussion with four key leaders in this national effort. David Hawkins, Executive Director for Educational Content and Policy at the National Association for College Admission Counseling. Paul Leather, Director for State and Local Partnerships, Center for Innovation and Education. Michael Riley, Executive Director of the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, and David Roof, Executive Director of the Great Schools Partnership. And finally, we'll have a few minutes to respond to questions from the audience. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout today's presentation in the chat box at the lower right of your screen. Again, please choose all participants from the drop-down to ensure we can see your questions. So the Reimagining College Access Initiative grew out of conversations with K-12 and higher education leaders who were seeking to promote deeper learning and advance student diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education through more robust information about students' deeper learning competencies and readiness for college. To that end, we sought to leverage high-quality K-12 performance assessments that uh, assess students' uh, mastery of academic content standards as well as skills needed for college, work, and life in the 21st century in more authentic and holistic ways than traditional standardized tests. There are, of course, many types of performance assessments, but just to give you an example to, to ground this work, rather than multiple choice end of semester, uh, multiple choice end of semester biology tests, students instead develop a research hypothesis based on the content they have learned design an experiment to test that hypothesis, conduct that experiment, write a report on the experiment and findings, and present the findings to a panel. This type of rich work is happening in schools across the nation, including in schools that serve high percentages of students of color, students from families with lower incomes, and students who are English learners. And at the local, state, and national levels, we've seen increasing momentum and movement towards building in these types of performance assessments as a part of a balanced system of assessments. So we began to think about how we could use this type of high quality performance assessment work more systematically to inform higher education admissions, placement, and success. Learning Policy Institute, along with our partners at the Education Council, convened a diverse national group of K-12 and higher ed leaders to explore three questions. How can college admissions, placement, and advising better account for students' development of 21st century skills and encourage the kinds of learning experiences that students need to develop um, in, in K-12? What can be learned from existing and emerging K-12 and higher ed partnerships that include performance assessments? And, and, and include those as part of admissions, placement, and advising? And how can such a system of support um, develop a more diverse uh, pool of qualified applicants as well as their enrollment and persistence in higher education? And what actors within these systems should be involved to make this happen? Three national task forces spent nearly a year exploring these questions and came up with a set of recommendations. And the recommendations are around developing a set of research-based criteria to assess the uh, level of quality and rigor of performance assessments, and this is to ensure that higher education has confidence in the rigor and quality of the work that's coming out of these performance assessment systems. Uh, 
there, another recommendation was around adapting and leveraging existing platforms, um, technological platforms that could be used to transmit performance assessment information between K-12 and higher education to pilot with uh, institutions that are ready, uh, K between uh, K-12 and higher education institutions that are ready to pilot some of these recommendations, conduct research on the use of performance assessments in admissions as well as um, beyond looking at student outcomes, develop a communications plan to share these learnings, and explore ways to include um, this type of performance assessment in higher education placement and advising. The initiative is now work moving into early implementation of these recommendations. LPI, along with Education Council, will be working to develop a national advisory board. We will also be developing regional and local partnerships with K-12 and higher education to pilot some of these recommendations. And that work will be supported by capacity building and innovation efforts to set criteria for quality work to adapt admissions materials and transcripts to include performance assessments and to generate the secure flow of performance assessment data across institutions. And we envision that folks outside of the partnerships will be participating in various ways to stay informed about our work as we move forward. To learn more about um, the, the resources that we have, you can go to our website. We have a report that we wrote on uh, the promise of performance assessments, innovations in higher, high school learning and college admissions, which uh, discusses opportunities in K-12 and higher education uh, to promote this type of work. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our panelists so we can have a discussion about some of these ideas. Uh, we'll start with uh, David Hawkins. Uh, he's, again, he's the Executive Director for Educational Content and Policy at the National Association for College Admission and Counseling, uh, which is based in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, NACAC is a nonprofit membership association that represents uh, more than 15,000 high school counselors and college admissions officers throughout the U.S. and around the world. Uh, the organization is devoted to making, transition, to making the transition between high school and post-secondary education equitable, transparent, and fair. Paul Leather is the Director of State and Local Partnerships from the Center for Innovation and Education. He previously served as a Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Education in New Hampshire for eight, for eight years, and for 18 years as the Department's Director of the Division of Career Technology and Adult Learning. He, uh, in 1997, as part of uh, New Hampshire School to Career Efforts, uh, began the journey to create a state model for a competency-based student transcript, which resulted in the New Hampshire Competency-Based Assessment System and ultimately to the student mastery model now in place um, in New Hampshire. And he led the first in the nation next generation educational accountability model called Performance Assessment of Competency Education, or PACE, which was approved as a pilot program with four New Hampshire districts in March 2015. Michael Riley is the Executive Director from the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, a position he has held since 2012. Uh, prior to coming to ACRO, he was Executive Director for the Council of Presidents, an association of the six public baccalaureate degree granting institutions in the state of Washington. He has served on numerous higher education boards and is a frequent writer and speaker on, speaker on public policy matters impacting higher education. And finally, we have David Roof, Executive Director of the Great Schools Partnership, um, and a, which is a, a founding member and a director of the New England Secondary School Consortium, a six-state partnership working to promote forward-thinking innovations in secondary education. And he has um, led the organization from an initial focus on efforts in Maine to an expansion across New England and the country, focusing on implementation of proficiency-based learning. So with that, I'd like to ask our panelists a few questions, and they can each uh, answer um, in turn or add to what others have said. And First question for you all is why why is the work that this the RCA has embarked upon so important? Uh, Ronita, this is David Hawkins, I suppose, since I'm first on the list there, I'll go ahead and, and kick it off. Um, I would say that there are two reasons in in my view from the from the college admission counseling perspective why this work is important. Number one is a, is a practical reason. Uh, Performance-based assessments are happening. They're, they're, 
they're being used in K-12 and, and even in higher ed to a degree. So from the admission counseling perspective, it's very important that uh, the people who work in college admission offices um, understand what they are and, and how they can be incorporated into uh, a student's academic record and interpreted, uh, particularly within the context of the college application. So it's very important that this effort um, connect with admission officers and, and school counselors as well uh, so that we can, can promote a broad understanding of what this phenomenon is uh, and, and ensure that everyone involved knows how to interpret um, what students are accumulating as they go through uh, the, the educational process. The second reason uh, that I think this is important is that it's a mission-driven um, effort uh, to try to stir the pot to a degree. Um, we know from the college admission perspective uh, that the factors that college admission officers consider in the admission process uh, tend to be pretty static, uh, and they're predictable in that they don't entirely predict student success in higher education, uh, and they yield pretty consistent results in terms of the student body year over year. Uh, so to a degree, uh, the, the factors that are currently in use have not moved the needle all that much on access and equity. Uh, we see the, uh, we, we regularly hear actually um, calls for, for greater contextual information about students uh, as a way of trying to explore different abilities uh, that fall outside of the existing factors. And, and in, in our view, the performance-based assessments uh, stand to, to do just that. And that's why we believe uh, from an ACAC's perspective that this is an important thing uh, to discuss and have admission officers engaged in. So, so I'll stop there, and, and we can go to the next next panelist. Renee, this is Mike Fred. If I could just follow up a little bit on the, from the higher ed perspective uh, and amplify what David said. There's, there's, there's two practice areas, I think, that are uh, ripe for some uh, new information to drive. And one, as, as David said, the, the admissions criteria, and you, you see a lot of discussion about schools moving to test optional approaches. They are really looking for a broader range of factors to make decisions about student success in college, and not just at the highly selective level where they're trying to differentiate a series of highly qualified students, but also assessing whether students who uh, are prepared to be successful at a, at a college or institution. The, the other area is, is placement, which has also been in transition, particularly at community colleges, where they're looking for things beyond simply a one-time placement test, which they have proved not to be very accurate and predictable about student success and are looking at ways to better place students into, into courses. So I think these, these assessments have the opportunity to have positive impacts on both of those sets of practices. Great, thank you, Mike. Paul or uh, David Roof, were you going to jump in? Yeah, uh, uh, Renita, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, when, when we look to see what um, uh, higher educators as well as uh, folks in the community, businesses and otherwise, uh, w what kinds of skills and knowledge are they looking for uh, from students in terms of uh, uh, being able to succeed both in college and, and on beyond? Uh, we see that they're looking for uh, a, a greater and deeper understanding of uh, core content, but also those uh, uh, success skills like uh, the ability to work with others, like the ability to uh, uh, communicate well, like the ability to uh, 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 be flexible and, and uh, uh, be able to be creative in a, a variety of different circumstances. Uh, when you look at the uh, admissions uh, uh, assessments and tests that are available, they're really not so strong in those areas. But uh, complex performance tasks and, and uh, assessment really gives you a deep uh, uh, look at, at that information. And uh, we want to be able to find a way in which we can share that information that we're, we're developing at the K-12 level uh, with admissions officers in a way that will be efficient and allow them to make decisions that would really uh, 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 bring, bring forward students who can be successful in college and university and can be successful in, in the business community once they're completed. Great. Thanks, Paul. David Roof, anything Renita. else you want to add? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I would um, – actually, I, I would build upon where um, Paul was headed on that. Um, so a couple things I'd share. Um, first off, for me, it's about a basic um, equity and fairness issue that's there. Um, and we know this is actually not a K-12 or a higher ed uh, stance uh, or insight uh, by itself, but actually shared across both of those that um, a lot of the measures that are used right now to make decisions about kids getting admissions into college are, um, uh, are unfairly advantage uh, certain populations of students. And so uh, moving to, towards this actually starts to open up uh, additional information about kids that they can share and understand. And so as Paul has noted there, that there are many, many um, characteristics of, of uh, students who will be successful in higher ed, they're actually not captured by the strategies we have today. They're not captured by standardized test scores. They're not captured by, um, by just looking at, at class grades. They're not captured by class rank. They don't give us the information that would be really helpful to know if kids are going to be successful and if it's the right placement for them. And so it's, at its core, I think it's a basic equity and fairness issue. The, the other piece that I would add on this, though, is that uh, I see it in our work here across New England and increasingly across the country, um, it's an incredible leverage point that's there because we know that because uh, students and parents are concerned about kids getting into um, colleges, uh, that that impacts the way that high schools think about the programs they're going to offer and what they're going to emphasize and what they're going to um, put an increased stress upon. That if we can bring in performance assessments into this, which are richer, more thoughtful, get it um, a broader skill set that we want for kids to have there, because it is used as a part of the college admissions process, it will leverage that change in the K-12 system. And so in some, by moving this direction, we get better equity, it's fairer for everybody involved, it presents a more complete picture, and it leverages practices all around uh, that, including in the high school level, including the admissions process, to, be, uh, to move in a, a better direction. All right, thank you, David. And I think I appreciate you actually articulating our theory of change for this work, which is that um, if higher education demands this type of authentic, holistic assessment of student learning, that more K-12 schools will actually engage in these types of practices. I appreciate that. Um, David, I'm actually wondering if you could share a little, David Roof, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about sort of um, emerging efforts in New England to connect um, K some of your K-12 school districts with, with higher ed institutions around um, competency-based education and mastery transcripts. Sure. Um, so, uh, I guess just to give you a sense of some some numbers, um, in, in in New England, if uh, if a, a hundred kids, hundred ninth graders who are um, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged enter our high schools, and this is true across and in, in combining all the data across New England, um, only about 17 of those students will actually get a four-year degree 12 years later, and so we're talking about um, giving them six years for high school and six years to get the four-year degree, uh, 17 of them will get that. And so certainly there's a little variation there from uh, school to school and state to state, but, but those numbers aren't very high. And when we look and we disaggregate that by race, um, it's, it's a little better in terms of students of color than the 17%, but it's still incredibly low. And so uh, there's no doubt that we've got to figure out a way to uh, not have these huge leakages in the pipeline that is happening for kids. And so our big effort, and uh, Paul has been a, a big part of this, of really pushing forward with a proficiency or competency-based learning system, uh, gets at the core of saying, let's make sure that all kids are gaining these skills and knowledge and these habits of mind. Let's hold them accountable to that. Let's hold schools accountable to that. And then they can actually be ready to be successful in higher ed. And we've done a lot of work with admissions officers in higher ed to get them to 
uh, understand the process, understand the transcripts they're going to start see, start seeing from this, and start um, being able to decipher and understand that. I mean, the, the great news is we're really not getting any pushback from higher ed. I think it's um, pretty obvious that um, we want the same thing of making sure that the kids, that we have a good match between the colleges kids go to and who and uh, the, the kids' skill set that's there. Um, but it's able, we're able to get more information for that. And quite honestly, the only way we get that uh, deeper, richer information is through better assessment systems that include performance assessments that actually measure these things that are so crucial to the eventual success. And I don't know, Paul, you may want to jump in there too. You've been involved in a lot of that work from the, uh, you know, the state perspective in New Hampshire, really ensuring that smooth transition. Yes, and, and uh, as we've seen more and more high schools across our state in New Hampshire, but also in Maine and uh, uh, New, uh, Vermont and Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, move to a proficiency-based or competency-based uh, learning model with uh, 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 deep performance assessment work, uh, as well as uh, a demonstration of uh, portfolios. Uh, um, one of the things that's occurred is that uh, parents still, you know, have the belief that the only thing that uh, colleges and universities are are interested in is, you know, that SAT or that ACT score, and so they'll keep asking, well, you know, you're doing all this work, but how's this going to affect my students' uh, ultimate success? And but when we talk to the admissions folks and and the colleges and universities in in New England, they say, no, we're we're looking at at how students are able to do in their work, and we're very interested in this deeper uh, uh, work that they're doing in high school and think that it's highly predictive of their success. So how can we provide, how can we get that information uh, on, on our transcripts, and how can we uh, signal, if you will, to the, our parents and to the larger community that that is what we're looking for and uh, that it's meaningful to uh, uh, for students and their success in college and university. So I think that signaling aspect, Renita, is, is a very important one now as we see so many of our high schools moving in this direction. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, David Hawkins and, and Michael Riley, I'd love to hear from your perspective, from your higher ed perspective. You know, Folks on the phone may want to know. Well, how, you know, if you're if you're a college admissions officer, how can you trust the information that's coming from this, these types of performance assessment systems? How do you, um, you know, and how do you place? What kind of value do you place on this type of information that's coming from schools and districts? Well, maybe I'll start. This is Mike. I think it, we we there are always challenges around trust on a lot of elements of admissions right now in terms of essays and uh, you know who wrote those things. I do think, I mean, from what I have seen, the examples where these are in place at high school districts, where teachers are conducting assessments, students doing videos, et cetera, I think those have the same element of trust of many other the components of uh, attributes that we look at at admissions. Certainly, I think to, uh, to ramp up the, the flat adoption curve, there is going to be a point where we're going to have to do some assessment, some, some post-enrollment evaluation of students to see how they do through you know, advancing through the coursework, how, how well they were placed, the success rates, et cetera. Um, but I think these are just as valid as others. And, you know, right now we do, I think there's, you know, David, the two Davids have been working on a, a process to try and make this information consumable for admissions officers because some might say, well, who's going to read this entire portfolio? But, you know, within the admissions process now, particularly holistic, admissions approaches, there are a number of labor-intensive processes, reading essays, conducting interviews, et cetera. So I think there, you know, with some work to refine this into, you know, consumable information that admissions officers will relish this as part of a, a you know, holistic review of their applicant pool and will really seeing uh, things beyond simply the grades and test scores to make their conclusions about admissions. And, and Mike, I, I would add, um, I agree with everything you said. Um, absolutely, there needs to be uh, the kind of track record uh, that is evident, particularly to leaders in college admission offices. Um, on, a, on, a, on a slightly different note, um, one of the one of the 
pieces of this puzzle uh, that, that we feel is important to put into place is to ensure that any college admission officer who comes into contact with uh, performance-based assessments in a school or a district uh, has a way of understanding uh, what this is um, because there are you know, tens of thousands of, of schools out there um, and, and, and in general, uh, college admission officers look at things like the school profile uh, to determine the kind of curriculum a school might have if, if the college isn't already familiar with it. So to a degree, uh, there will be, as I said in the opening, a, 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 a vigorous education campaign uh, that we'll be you know, certainly glad to contribute to to help uh, admission officers understand across the board what these, what these are and what to expect when you're looking at a school uh, who says they, they use performance assessments. So that's a, that's a, I think that's, again, one of, the, one of the primary values of this project is to make sure everybody understands and, and, and to have a sort of a common understanding of, of, of what these are when they see them. That's great. As we start moving towards piloting, um, with, you know, piloting some, of the, some of the recommendations between K-12 school districts and, and higher ed partners, um, what are you all excited about? What, what, what are some of the things looking forward to uh, seeing happen through these pilots? Well, this is Mike. I mean, I, I certainly would, you know, am excited to see examples of where uh, local schools, the districts in, in, in partnership with their uh, post-secondary institutions can use some of the things like the digital transcript or the are the uh, online admissions application to include this information embedded in that application so that uh, you know we can actually see it in practice um, you know one of the things that I'm excited about this this really does align with a movement that's taking place at the post-secondary level where one of the challenges we've had is that students have a wide variety of learning that takes place and their college uh, experience, and yet the only thing we provide is documentation of that to hand to the employer is a transcript that shows their grades and test scores. And everybody would say, well, that's an incomplete picture. The same dynamic is taking place coming out of, of high schools where students are doing this rich work, and yet it's not being considered uh, as part of the business process. So that, that it's really exciting to be able to capture the full range of learning and see how that can impact students, because I, I, you know, I firmly believe that it will increase access and opportunity. It will increase success for students, and it, it will build confidence in students, particularly students for whom you know, higher education may be not part of their family experience, to make them more confident to seek to go to a more selective institution or get a little bit out of their comfort zone. So that's what excites me about this process. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And Ronita, Ronita I'd like to add uh, that, that I, just uh, on top of what Michael was saying, uh, you know, as you pointed out when you introduced me, I've been at this for a few few years. And, uh, you know, as early as the early 2000s, we were hearing that, you know, it's great great that uh, students are generating this uh, material and this work that they're doing, but, you know, how can we efficiently uh, review this at a, in an admissions offer, office that's looking at uh, potentially thousands of applicants? Uh, meanwhile, we have, we've had the digital re revolution where, Transcripts are now digital. Uh, many of the materials that are coming forward are, are electronic and, and common. And uh, so, so there is now a, a new opportunity to take a look at, at student work. And if we're, if we're able to actually dialogue between K-12 and, and higher ed uh, admissions officers about, you know, what, what is it that you really want to see and, and what will help you in terms of making a decision, we're going to be able to provide better information uh, more efficient information. I think we can make a system that's going to be much more usable for for everyone concerned. And I'm I'm just excited after these many years that we're going to be able to work together and 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 make this happen. You know, Renita, I, I'd add that there's a, a bunch of things that uh, really uh, have got us thinking and excited about this, and really um, wanting to be a part of this. Um, building on what Mike and Paul have talked about here, um, I fully expect that we'll start to see uh, different transcripts that are more descriptive and accurate and what kids know and are able to do and are not based upon um, 
you know, I think a grading systems that we don't really know. There's a lack of consistency there. So we can get more consistent, more accurate, more detailed about that. I think that it will enable um, there to be a better uh, placements in uh, higher ed. And so that I think that sometimes, uh, you know, uh, every college is good for some kids, but part of the dilemma here is which college is right for which kid. Um, and this will uh, be, a, enable more information to be there for both students and parents and higher ed to make better decisions about what is uh, that alignment of that placement that's there, um, which I would hope would decrease the dropout rate in higher ed, um, which I would hope would change some of the demographics of what we're seeing uh, for our college population of students that are there, um, leveraging all that. And then I would uh, be remiss not to note back at the high school level, um, you know, almost all states have uh, in their state standards have uh, noted things that, um, you know, 21st century skills or transferable skills or guiding principles that, you know, they're, um, you know, they're, they're these uh, skills and knowledge that cross content areas. They don't reside uh, just within a single content area. And performance assessment is the way to actually start getting at that, measuring that, encouraging that that's there. And it, uh, I think that we'll start to see conversations between students, teachers, and parents that are about student acquisition of those skills rather than uh, a focus on is it an A, a B, or a C. And it's not that I don't want uh, conversations to be there about the quality of the work. I actually do want there to be conversations about the quality of the work. But the it's simply focusing on did I get an A is the wrong conversation as opposed to what are the qualities of my work that enable this to be an A and is it really focusing in on those key important things around the 21st century skills or, 20, or transferable skills that are there. Absolutely. And, um, David uh, Hawkins, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I had one additional um, aspect of this that excites me, and that, and Mike alluded to this earlier, and, and, and that is that um, if the, if college admission offices start um, understanding, using uh, the information that's that's available to them through these assessments, uh, it provides them with with a larger number of data points that they can use to evaluate what predicts student success at their institution, and Again, I think what, what excites me overall about the project is that, that with this research, we could see a, a shift in the, the hegem hegemony of the current factors in the admission process um, because it seems that with this added context, we could discover more about what, what leads to student success in post-secondary education. Great. Before I ask um, my next question, I do want to remind the audience that if you um, want to ask questions or engage in discussion, uh, please do use the chat box on the right of your screen and select all participants from the drop-down and enter in your question or your message. Um, so I, I do want to make sure you know, that we talk about some of the potential challenges in this work um, and, and some things that might be uh, worrying you about uh, moving this initiative forward. And, I want to specifically ask um, David Hawkins and Michael Riley, how do we get faculty from colleges on board? We know that in a lot of particularly public institutions, in private as well, um, you know, the admissions offices um, are not independent from, from faculty boards who oversee some of those requirements. So just curious how, how we move that forward. Yeah, this is, it, this is Mike. At most institutions, faculty certainly set the admission standards for the institution, and they are they are evidence-based creatures. And um, you know, as as new uh, approaches have taken place, I mean, there was probably a time when you know advanced placement was not uh, considered for placement into courses and to advanced standing in institutions when it first came on board. And through you know, again follow-up studies and research and analysis, I think people can be engaged in this. I think um, they're, they're also, you know, as we, we are going to have to do a research agenda uh, to develop, you know, they'll, they'll need to see a, a pretty robust set of criteria. There has, again, has to be evidence-based, has to be rooted in a, 
in, in, in factors that have demonstrated success. I think, um, you know, r right now, I think faculty are actually looking for different attributes as well. I think they see the shortcomings of, you know, relying too much on standardized tests. They can see the evidence about that. They see these arguments. And if we can bring to them alternatives to that for them to consider, I think it will get a lot of traction. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, and I, I, I think the uh, Mike, Mike is, is right on point. Of course, um, the 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 challenge that I fear, of course, is is inertia, um, and I think that in a number of ways, inertia works against us because in the admission office, uh, things tend to move pretty quickly, and there there is a limited amount of time uh, that that college admission officers have to learn about new uh, aspects of the educational system, to um, implement any sort of new factors into their application review process. And I expect the same would go for the, the process that, that Mike described with the, faculty, the relationship with, with faculty on campus. Uh, but as Mike said, um, I've certainly picked up a distinct um, wariness among Faculty, uh, which is which runs parallel to the weariness that that admission officers feel uh, with the current factors in the admission decision, and of course we all are familiar with with the research on the large numbers of students needing uh, remediation once they arrive in higher education. So I think the environment is is ripe uh, for this sort of new approach, and 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 as Mike said, I think it, there's just going to need to be a fairly extensive process where we can educate both the admission offices and the, and the faculty as to what this is and how it relates to student success. Thank you. Uh, Paul or David Roof, do you want to say anything about um, potential challenges or concerns that you're, you're worried about as we move forward? Uh, sure. I can jump in here. Um, uh, I guess there's always a lot of worries that, that are there, but a couple, I would highlight two of them. Um, and really, I know that David and Mike would know more about this, but it's just, you know, overwhelming the system. I mean, I think there's all kinds of information we'd like to share um, with uh, in the college admissions process, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. we just have to remember and, be, and acknowledge that they've got a job and they've got a lot of um, applicants in front of them. We've got to figure out a way to streamline that while still getting solid information there. Um, but the, the second piece that, that I would put in here um, is that I think we have to be cautious um, about working too much to replace standardized testing and as a result, as a consequence of trying to replace standardized testing, we try to impose uh, assessment criteria onto performance assessment that uh, are extremely difficult to, uh, to attain and as a result um, cut out the thoughtful engagement and process that is only attainable through performance assessment. And so we end up with a system where we say we can reliably measure this, but we don't actually put a whole lot of trust and faith in what we're actually reliably measuring. And so I, I think we've got to make sure that we place this in a way that um, doesn't try to meet um, assessment standards that it can't meet, um, but that it is uh, still high quality. I'm not arguing at all against high quality, thoughtful, um, trustworthy, uh, information, but I just don't want to put it up to a standard that it can't reach and it forces us to, um, to, to really uh, make fundamental changes in the performance assessment that remove richness there. And Renita, I, I agree with David, uh, you know, the richness and the depth of the work in, in performance assessment is really uh, the high value that, you, that is gained. And, at, but at the same time, uh, uh, one of the concerns and challenges, I think, uh, as, as we scale uh, performance assessment work across uh, the states, and that's some of the work that I've been very much involved in the last uh, few years, uh, is that um, we, have, we have folks who are very skilled at this work. Uh, uh, there, there are any number of websites now that you could go on and see 
very high quality performance assessment work and and see students who I dare say are, are you know th there might be a competition to to admit those students to uh, colleges and universities at the same time other other high schools are are just starting this process and so there there's sophistication in both presentation and in the actual uh, work the, the the deeper work may not be as 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 uh, uh, high quality as we might see in another school. And that'll become pretty evident uh, through this process. And so I, I wanna make sure that as we start to scale this work, uh, that, that uh, we, we are able to raise uh, uh, the performance of our, of our high schools, our, our high school educators, and, and thus our students uh, to a level that will meet the expectations of uh, both admissions and uh, uh, higher educators. I think that's going to be a big challenge for K-12, but it's a challenge we we need to face no matter what, no matter what kind of evidence we're providing. And Renita, I can certainly appreciate that some places might be feeling a little bit of reform fatigue as we've, uh, you know, navigated, <laughs> you know, federal mandates about no child left behind. Now we have the ESSA exams. People are, you know, t t teachers are challenged by new approaches to evaluation. David's members, the counselors, certainly have you know, incredible workloads. So I can imagine as another concept gets brought forward, people will just say, well, this is going to get any traction, or is this something I'm going to spend a lot of time on, and the next reform is going to, going to take over. But I really do think this, this has traction. It, it's, uh, it's not rooted in a particular uh, you know, federal mandate about assessments. I mean, it's an opportunity for school districts and, and to, to build some, some systems that work well for them. And, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a specific type of assessment. These can vary from uh, school to school. They can include portfolios or more uh, integrated uh, uh, senior level uh, theses. Uh, there's just a lot of ways to do it. So I, I would hope people um, don't view this as a, you know, a mandate from on high, but really an opportunity to kind of organically build something that that captures the strengths of your student learning and places them in a better position for college and career success. Mike, just, and I actually have a follow-on question to that. And we, we started you know, this conversation by saying one of the goals of this initiative is to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher ed. I'm kind of curious what you think um, this, this initiative and, um, and how performance assessments can be used in different types of higher ed institutions, whether you're talking about, and you mentioned community college, um, you know, big public state universities versus, you know, your selective universities. How could you envision this, this type of authentic student work being used in different ways in different institutions? Because, you know, obviously they have different missions, uh, different student bodies, uh, different, you know, all of that. So love, you, love for you to speak to that. Well, I would say, you know, again, we, we often think about the use of these at highly selective institutions, and there's certainly a place for that. I could see them using these to differentiate, you know, highly qualified candidates uh, and also maybe make decisions about scholarships and other things. But I also think at a less selective level, one of the challenges is to ensure that the students you enroll will be successful. And many of them may be coming from lower resource school districts, may not have done as well on standardized tests or the standardized measures, but you really want to make a decision about their likelihood of success there. And this can be a, a piece of information that can help you draw better conclusions about the student's success. And again, as I mentioned earlier, at the community college level, they really are migrating now from, a, from an access to a success model. If they've been open enrollment, um, they've always had challenges about accurately placing students in the courses, and we're seeing a re reduction in the number of you know, uh, uh, placement uh, examination uh, tools that are out there. So they're looking for more creative ways to do this. So I think community colleges really could benefit from partnerships with their local schools to use these assessments as tools to more accurately place students in the programs. It could be a nice transition into the pathway work that's taking place at a lot of community colleges right now in the country. It'd be a great onboarding transition into a pathway project. So I think, I think it has multifaceted opportunities for a wide range of institutions, and I hope we don't focus too much uh, on the highly selective institutions where you see you know, the national debates and the lawsuits, et cetera, that this has opportunities for a variety of types of institutions. Great, thank you. David Hawkins, do you want to add anything else? 
I would just add that from a competitive uh, angle, you know, there are an awful lot of institutions out there that specialize um, in, in one field or another, uh, uh, you know, sort of build themselves as, as wanting to attract a certain type of student. And I, and I think that, and, and when I say a certain type of student, I mean students who present certain skills, interests, um, special, uh, specializations, et cetera. So I think in addition to uh, the evaluative uh, component of performance assessments, they could also even offer uh, colleges a, a more insightful look at the types of students they might be very deliberate in pursuing. So, so I think it, it, as we look at it through a college's own self-interest, uh, this, this could have benefits that, that go beyond even just the benefits we've, we've already discussed. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, we, We've talked about sort of the, the challenges that this work might present for admissions offices, you know, in looking at, you know, lots of student work. I'm actually wondering, you know, for students and families, you know, who are already stressed by the admissions process, um, how, what would you say to them, um, to families who feel like this, um, you know, adds to, you know, adds on another challenge to an already stressful admissions process? I would, I would probably jump in and say that uh, something that, that our members have told us countless times in the 18 years that I've, that I've worked here, and that is that wouldn't it be great if you just told students and families that what you did in high school was going to be the thing that mattered in college admission? Uh, and so in an ideal scenario, if, 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 these assess if this performance assessment model is implemented in the school and it turns out to be a uh, a useful and, and helpful part of the admission process, then really it, it, in theory, at least should ease that mindset for students and families that, you know, this is, you're, you're more than a, you're, you're, you're more than, than, you know, a test score or than a single uh, numeric grade or, or, you know, any, any other of the, of the factors that we tend to fixate on. So, so I would hope that this would actually reduce stress. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a question in the chat that I want to make sure we get to. Um, it's from folks uh, at Public Advocates. Uh, it says, it was mentioned this work is happening in high schools, but has this model been implemented pre-high school with K-8 schools? And I'll say yes. Um, there are a lot of um, this type of performance assessment work is happening in K-8 schools. Uh, Paul, do you want to maybe talk about New Hampshire as an example of where this work is happening K-12? Paul, did we lose you? Sorry, I keep, Renita, I keep muting myself. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yes, Renita, I, I, um, in New Hampshire, uh, we found out pretty quickly that uh, just focusing on, on this deeper kind of teaching and learning at the high school level uh, ultimately didn't make a lot of sense if uh, uh, students were coming uh, in uh, fr uh, from their experience from K through uh, 8 from a very traditional model. Uh, essentially, they had to learn how to, how to, how to learn again, and, and, and uh, teachers had to approach things in a, in a wholly new way. Uh, so what we've done is we've moved to a, a, a K through 12 uh, kind of a model where we're involved in performance assessment uh, from, from uh, uh, the very earliest grades right on through middle school and on into high school. And it's a part of our accountability system for those uh, schools and districts that have chosen to make that a part of their work, as well as they're you know, deeply in, uh, ensconced in, in how they do teaching and learning. And uh, uh, when we look across the, the country, and I'm sure David uh, uh, can, can attest to this, uh, those those schools and districts that are really moving to proficiency-based or competency-based learning are finding this to be true. And, and so, uh, yes, this is an effort that maybe started at the high school level, um, but uh, uh, we're seeing it uh, K through 12 and, and uh, a big movement actually uh, uh, across the country in this regard. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I I would I would just jump in too. I think Paul is absolutely right on target. Um, you know, we we have seen um, a lot of policy that has been around uh, 
the graduation requirements and trying to promote competency or proficiency through that um, policy lever. But uh, I think the more successful places we're seeing implementation, we're seeing uh, the, while it's a graduation decision, it's being attended to K-12. And so, again, the, the assessment strategies and practices that are using in, people using in, in high schools are using K-8. And we're seeing a lot of uh, places implement some like knee joint uh, assessments, kids getting out of third grade or fifth grade or eighth grade, so they can really um, pull together their learning in ways that are really meaningful for them, that are insightful for them, that help parents and students understand those pieces. And so it's, um, it, it's pretty, I would say it's flourishing, performance assessment is flourishing K-12. It's, uh, it's, it's universal there. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just a question for, you know, Paul and David Roof and, and for, for the other folks as well. What are some of the policy implications for this emerging work? And I'm thinking about policy implications at both the local and state level, but also higher ed policy. Well, uh, from a policy standpoint, uh, uh, there are multiple levels of summative assessment, uh, you know, in, in K-12. You know, there's the there's the state and federal uh, summative assessments, and then there are uh, assessments that uh, students uh, are involved in uh, when they move from one grade to another grade, uh, and as they move forward, um, and then and then you have uh, uh, those decisions that are that are summative that that um, relate to uh, college uh, access. Uh, so, uh, from the policy standpoint, there's been a lot of attention in K-12 around um, uh, moving away from large-scale state assessments uh, that don't provide a lot of uh, great information, if you will, uh, to the learning process at the local level. And there's been a lot of attention recently to how could performance assessments be used as a part of the accountability process and, and provide much deeper, much richer information for students as they move through their their schooling as well as for educators. And uh, so there's a, there's a high interest uh, in a number of states now in how can they start to apply a, a more balanced system of assessments, uh, both at the state and federal level as well as at the, at the local level. Uh, so, so part of this effort, it, it, it is happening and it is growing, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, uh, affecting many different facets of the system. And, and that's all going on as we speak, and, and uh, I, I'm very much involved in that. David, I know, is very much involved in it, and a number of others are nationally. I know uh, 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 the Learning Policy Institute and Ed, Ed Council have been very much involved in that level of the work as well. But as I mentioned earlier, Ronita, um, signaling that, um, uh, that colleges and universities see the importance of this work uh, is going to help uh, move it along faster and really create a better public education system uh, for in our country uh, in a, at a faster pace. Okay, you know, you Renita, I, I'd build on I'd build on Paul too to um, put a couple buckets out there. I mean, I think there's a you know policy question always brings up you know what what barriers are being created by current policy. And the second bucket of what support or enticements could be built through uh, change policy that's there. And both of those play out both at the state and at the district level. And I, and I think there's a lot of district policies that impact some of this uh, that often gets overlooked. But particularly in some of our larger districts, we've got policies that um, I don't think people intend them to be uh, problematic in this way, but end up uh, kind of coming at it from a side, coming at it from the side that caused some problems and shifts there. But I do think we've got to look at issues around um, school, uh, your state level, state accountability regulations for schools and districts, because if they emphasize certain practices over others, um, you'll actually start to see those pieces. Everybody knows that's a leverage point, and so we've got to leverage performance assessment into that. It gets down to the student level when you have things like GPA and ranking class and how those pieces are used in there. Um, it gets into potentially policies around course structures, particularly if we want assessments, performance assessments that 
um, operate outside of the normal um, content structures we have for courses that are there. It can get into the whole issue of state data collection and what are the data points that states are collecting that are there. And it can even get into the whole issue of state uh, teacher licensure that um, enables, you know, which teachers can actually um, pass official judgment on how kids are doing uh, on these assessments and is, it, is there other licensure issues that uh, curtail that or support that. So there's a, there's a bunch of things and I think it's like a lot that we've seen in moving from state to state that um, each state has some interesting and unique pieces that can promote that and some interesting and unique pieces that can uh, be barriers to that. And Renita, certainly at the post-secondary level, there are differences between an independent institution whose faculty can make decisions about admissions and placement and say a Cal State University system where there's 23 institutions working as a system to make these kinds of changes. So the policy implications can vary greatly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have about two more minutes. Uh, I want to make sure uh, participants or uh, that uh, folks on the phone have an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, so if you have any burning questions, please put them into the chat box. We probably have time for about one. And I'll wait about 30 seconds in case anybody wants to type something in. Seeing no additional questions coming in, um, I do want to thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion. I'd like to remind the audience that we uh, are recording this webinar and we will email you in a few days when it's available online. We'd also like to remind you to sign up for our email list to be notified of our next uh, webinar in this series. Again, it's how it's done, what school networks can teach us about scaling up deeper learning practices. And we'd like to share the following online resources, which will also be posted on this webinar's page. And finally, we'd like to let you know that a survey will appear in your web browser when this webinar ends. It'll take just a few minutes to complete, so if you have the time, we'd love to get your feedback. Thank you again, and have a good afternoon, everybody.